September 16, 1943, the South Pacific. Marine Squadron VMF-214, better known as the Black Sheep, puts its F-4U Corsairs to the test. Suddenly, dozens of Japanese Zeros pounce. December 1950. Four American F-86 Sabres dart through Korean airspace in dire need of a victory. 25,000 feet below, communist North Korea has waged war on the South and its United Nations allies for six months. Here on the ground, it's hell on Earth. Many Americans are feeling very confident coming out of the end of World War II with a victory, and all of a sudden, they are met with a disastrous defeat at the opening of the Korean War. Overhead, chaos strikes as North Korea's Soviet comrades unleash MiG-15 jets. Facing them are inferior F-80s and F-84s. MiG-15 was much faster, uh, could go much higher, uh, and had really good armament on the airplane. It totally outclassed the F-80 and the F-84. Desperate, the US Air Force calls up its newest weapon, the F-86 Sabre jet. December 17th, at Kimpo Airfield, Ground crews prepare the Sabres for battle with the MiG. Leading the hunt is Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Hinton. Like the entire US Air Force, Hinton is eager to see how the Sabre matches up against its tenacious rival. His F-86s are untested in combat, and he's only taking four to the raid. This could be a suicide mission. Deep in North Korean territory, Hinton's strategy is to deceive the MiGs. For this mission against these MiG-15s, Hinton used the element of surprise by using the call signs of F-80s to make MiGs think that this was a vulnerable group of slower fighters. Suddenly, the number two pilot spots enemy aircraft 7,000 feet below. The trap is set. The MiGs have no idea there are Sabre jets flying high above them. The Sabre pilots peel off in pursuit of their targets. Hinton names for the closest bogey, peppering the MiG as he watches smoke trail from its wing. But there's no time for celebration. In the heated dogfight, Hinton strays from his wingman. A dangerous move. To make it home alive, he must finish the MiG solo. The flight leader presses in on his opponent. He unloads 1,500 rounds. The MiG erupts in flames. For the first time, America's state-of-the-art jet has taken out a MiG. The Sabre has arrived and the U.S. Air Force has the first victory in its newest combat assassin. First air-to-air -air kill of an F-86 against a MiG-15 is a great moment, not just for Hinton personally, but it also represents that we've entered this new age and this epic rivalry that's going to become so iconic. May 18th, 1953. Captain Joe McConnell takes off in his Sabre with a record-breaking 13 victories. McConnell has been flying in combat for eight months. Today is his last day in Korea. It's quiet as McConnell and his wingman, Dean Abbott, approach MiG Alley. Suddenly, the duo spot a pair of MiGs. McConnell must decide, make it home alive or risk his life for one more mission. McConnell gambles on a daring final sortie and speeds after the bogeys. But just as the Sabres close in for the kill, 28 MiGs ambush the eager Americans. For McConnell, it's just where he wants to be. He sees a big formation of MiGs. That's just what he wanted. 
He flies into that formation knowing that some of the MiG-15s will turn and slow down. That means McConnell can catch them. McConnell brakes hard and flies straight into a MiG formation. Rolling in behind one, he takes it out. Then, on the tail of a second Soviet jet, McConnell rips off another burst and tears it apart. Now, MiGs swarm from all directions. They're attacking so fast and thick, they're in danger of shooting each other down. Remaining calm, McConnell and Abbott miraculously escape the chaotic melee. McConnell was a great shot. He was cool in combat from all his experience in World War II, and he knew how to employ the right tactics to make the MiG-15s make a mistake so McConnell could line up a clean shot. The pair outrun the mix back across the Korean border. Running on fumes, they barely make it back to base. McConnell adds three more MiGs to his name. With 16 confirmed kills, he's a triple ace and the Korean War's top scorer. The nature of fighter pilot culture emphasizes competitiveness. For McConnell to end up on top as the top scoring ace is huge, not only personally, but he certainly becomes a role model for others to look up to. After three years of combat, McConnell and his co-pilots finally gain air superiority. In the summer of 1953, a ceasefire officially ends their brutal war in Korea. America's celebrity ace returns home to the California desert. He's met with fanfare and a warm embrace from his wife, Pearl. But in a devastating twist of fate, he's killed a year later in the jet that made him a star. When the Air Force offers him a chance to become a test pilot, naturally, he leaps at it. But it's a new variant of the F-86 that will end McConnell's life. McConnell not only survived some of the most harrowing combat of the Korean War, he was extremely successful at it. McConnell's death is just more evidence of how dangerous test piloting really was during this time. The B-29. It's the aircraft that revolutionized long-range bombing. Behind me is the B-29 Super Fortress. This aircraft was a marvel of engineering and manufacture and the most expensive weapon system of World War II. The B-29 is 99 feet long, nearly 28 feet tall, and its wingspan measures out to a whopping 141 feet. To get it off the ground, the Super Fortress relies on four massive piston engines. Well, these are Curtis Wright 3350s, and they're 2,200 horsepower apiece. So they provide a lot of power, but at a heavy aircraft like this, you certainly need it. These supply the 60-ton bomber with enough power to reach speeds up to 365 miles per hour. Combined with altitudes up to 32,000 feet, the Army Air Forces hope the B-29s can get in and get out before the Japanese even know they're there. The B-29 is armed with enough firepower to make it an aerial fortress. Here I have twin 50 caliber Browning uh, machine guns. They're attached to a lower gun turret. We have an upper gun turret and several others around the aircraft that make this a formidable weapon system. The B-29's five gun turrets are located on the top, bottom, and tail of the aircraft. The four gunners and the bombardier can take control of the turrets remotely using the B-29's computerized system. This is the gun sighting device, and Whichever uh, of the gun turrets I have control over, and that can vary, will be uh, connected to this device. And if I rotate it, that tilts the guns up and down. If I twist, it'll turn the gun turret. 
As an enemy fighter approaches, one gunner can take control of multiple turrets. Using the computerized gun sights, the B-29's targeting system estimates the path of the aircraft and calculates where to fire. It was very well respected by the fighters because they knew if they got anywhere near this aircraft, they were going to get obliterated. June 5th, 1945. North Airfield, Tinian Island. A group of 45 B-29 bombers take off towards the Japanese mainland. Once airborne, the crew of the B-29 Sweet Su set course for the city of Kobe. Kobe was a big industrial city. The population is somewhere around 300,000. And we were aiming for the steel mill, which was in the south central part of the city. First Lieutenant Don Dwyer was a B-29 bombardier with the 9th Bomb Group in World War II. As the fleet of B-29s reach the city of Kobe, all eyes are on the Sweet Sioux. As the lead plane's bombardier, it's up to Dwyer to hit the target first. Dwyer peers through his bombsite and locks on to the steel mill. But as the B-29s prepare to drop, a swarm of Japanese fighters are waiting for them. Sweet Sue's gunners begin spraying the sky with bullets. They'll need to keep the fighters at bay until Dwyer can release the payload. Dwyer hits the switch and drops his 19-bomb payload. The other B-29s follow suit, hitting right on target. Everybody gave a sigh of relief that this was over with and let's get out of here. But as Dwyer looks up from his bomb site, there's a Japanese fighter headed right for them. We had a zero coming 12 o'clock. His intention probably was to ram us. Dwyer quickly grabs his gun sight and aims at the incoming fighter. I waited for his uh, wingtips to come into the circle and gave him one burst. His shots are right on the money. But the fighter gets one in of his own. He hit us with four 20 millimeter cannon shells. Two of them took out uh, two of the engines. With only two engines still running, they won't have enough power to make it back to Tinian. We knew we were gonna have to contact Iwo Jima and make a landing there. The newly captured island of Iwo Jima is the halfway point between Japan and the B-29's home base at Tinian. The Sweet Sioux comes in low and hits the runway hard. Once we got down and we realized that we were safe, we were overjoyed at that point. With three confirmed and two probable kills, the crew of the Sweet Sioux has had one of the most successful run-ins against Japanese fighters in the war. January 1933. Out of the ashes of a global depression, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler clinches an iron grip on the German Republic. The dangerous new Fuhrer brazenly defies World War I disarmament orders and rapidly begins mobilizing German forces. Across the channel, the British Air Force relies on proven technology, biplanes. But these planes have one major disadvantage, speed. 
Biplane design was just what pilots wanted in World War I. It was maneuverable. You could tuck and turn, but the biplanes of World War I weren't very fast. Advanced engines now allow planes to fly at groundbreaking speeds. But while biplanes are stable and maneuverable, they're limited to how fast they can fly. When a biplane reaches over 200 miles per hour, its double set of wings causes drag and makes the plane unstable. In Germany, the Luftwaffe soon realized a single set of wings, or monoplane, creates the balance between stability and speed. The Germans' bombers are built around new, fast engines that can easily outpower the RAF's aging biplanes. A modern war looms in Europe. The British must refuel their strapped economy and rebuild their air force with a new air fleet. At Hawker Aircraft, aeronautical expert Sidney Cam has a cost-effective solution. Cam turns to his trusted Hawker Fury biplane and gives it an innovative makeover. He retains the wooden framing and fabric fuselage of his Fury but replaces its double set of wings with a single set. He encloses the cockpit, then widens and retracts the landing gear. The result is a halfway house between the old and the new, perfect for a war on limited resources. The Hawker Hurricane was largely constructed from a mixture of wood and fabric. This is known as conventional aircraft construction. And at the time, it meant that the airplane was much faster to build, as well as much easier to repair. This meant that hurricanes were able to be repaired by their ground crews when aircraft like the Spitfire were being written off for similar battle damage. It also meant that the hurricane could be produced in quantity much faster because the infrastructure to build this type of aircraft fuselage was well and truly in place in England, whereas all metal aircraft fuselages were a relatively new advancement. Inside its adaptable frame is the hurricane's greatest asset, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. With the Merlin engine, the Hawker Hurricane became the first monoplane fighter to go faster than 300 miles per hour. It was the first of the fighters to go into production. That meant that by late 1939, the RAF had 600 Hurricanes in the inventory. That would turn out to be a crucial margin. In 1937, the RAF incorporates the fast, easy-to-produce hurricane into service. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Japan catches America sleeping. At Pearl Harbor that morning, people look up from the deck of a battleship and they see Japanese planes at low level. Dr. Rebecca Grant is one of the foremost civilian experts on air combat history. The sense of shock is indescribable, overwhelming, that a Japanese attack was coming on this beautiful, clear Sunday morning. At 7.40 a.m., the first Japanese planes swoop in over the harbor and hammer everything in their path. All around, you have explosions, strafing, fires, oil slicks, crews desperately trying to save the battleships that they're on. On the ground at Hickam, hangars are burning, oil is exploding, planes are taxiing. It's chaos and devastation. Leading the charge is Japan's premier fighter, the Zero. The Mitsubishi A6M Zero is Japan's top-of-the-line fighter plane. It is the dominant fighter in the Pacific in December of 1941. The Zero is light, it's fast, and it has a phenomenal carrier range. It's the perfect Navy fighter for Japan. The Zero is so light and maneuverable, it can fly circles around American fighters. This is the Japanese Zero, the most feared airplane at the beginning of World War II. Mark Murphy is an international warbird instructor and air show pilot. 
greatest strengths that the Zero has by far is its agility. It's a light airplane. This airframe is one of the thinnest of any of the combat airplanes. So the skin is so thin on this airplane that uh, our ground crew is not allowed to push on this fuselage or the wings on this airplane because if you put put any any pressure on that at all, well, you can see how light and thin that is. The skin is actually moving. On a lot of the other airplanes during World War II, you could, you could push anywhere on here, not on the Japanese Zero. Weighing less than 4,000 pounds, the Zero reaches speeds of over 340 miles per hour. And when the Zero slips in behind an enemy plane, it drops the hammer. One of the deadly features of this aircraft are these two 30 caliber machine guns. The pilot had to cock the gun and they were synchronized to shoot through the propellers. So they're inline guns. That's all the pilot had to do was look through this gun sight right here. Whatever he had in his sights, he was going to shoot. Early 1944, the Allies have Germany in retreat and Hitler grows desperate. He launches the most brutal assault, unleashing the Wunderwaffe, or miracle weapons. They are self-guided missiles and bombs, launched from Europe and aimed straight at the heart of England. The first, the deadly V-1. There's two sides to the, to the V-1. There's the physical damage that it can do, but also there's the damage to the morale of hearing that sound coming overhead. The V-1 assault on London could take place at any time, day or night. So there's that constant tension. England is helpless against this monster from the future. So British engineers try to do the impossible, use existing Spitfires to take on the flying bomb. The Supermarine Company has adapted the Spitfire several times. And one of the biggest advances comes when they add the new Rolls-Royce Griffin engine to create the Mark 14 variant. The design of the Spitfire was so strong that from the engine firewall back, hardly any changes were needed, if any at all, to allow for a different engine. So you could go from the Mark I Spitfire with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, just over 1,000 horsepower, to the Rolls-Royce Griffin in the Mark 14. Double the horsepower and an increase in speed of around about 100 miles per hour. Now reaching speeds of over 400 miles per hour, the Spitfire will need all the power this new engine can deliver. Soon after the D-Day invasion, the Germans are firing over 100 V-1s into England each day. The fight against the V-1 presented some of the Spitfire's most amazing moments in combat. The extra power of this new engine in the Spitfire enabled it to chase down the V-1. Spitfires race after the V-1s but it takes more than speed to bring one down. It takes an expert shot. If the pilot is too far away, it's hard to hit the small V1, but get too close and the 2,000 pound warhead could blow up his own plane. Spitfire pilots like Australian Ken Collier have to summon superhuman courage to destroy these flying bombs. June 23rd, 1944, Ken Collier in his Spitfire spots a V-1 coming across the English Channel. Collier is determined to get it. He closes, he's in hot pursuit. Collier fires two bursts, emptying his guns. But the V-1 won't go down. Desperate, he flies right up to the 2,000-pound bomb. It's an incredibly risky move. Collier can kill himself doing this, but he's determined to kill this V-1. These images capture the moment a Spitfire closes in on a V-1. Touching the rocket's wing, Collier forces it into an out-of-control spin. It explodes harmlessly in an open field. Other pilots adopt Collier's dangerous maneuver. The Germans fire more than 9,000 V-1s at England and over 1,000 are shot or knocked out of the sky. In early 1943, frontline Marine fighter units start flying the Corsair. It seems almost custom-built for pilots like Gregory Pappy Boynt. 
This is the mighty F-4U Corsair, one of the most powerful and lethal aircraft of World War II. It combined great speed with hard-hitting armament, good armor protection, self-sealing fuel tanks, and good range. This aircraft was designed to be a zero killer. In the South Pacific, Boeington builds what would become one of the most famous fighter squadrons of the war, the Black Sheep. So the Black Sheep were pilots who hadn't fit into or been assigned to another squadron. Boynton suggested pulling them together into one coherent unit, VMF-214, and they took the name the Black Sheep Squadron. But it's unclear how this group of misfits and their heavy, hard-punching fighter will fare against the light, nimble Zero. September 16, 1943, the South Pacific. Marine Squadron VMF-214, better known as the Black Sheep, puts its F-4U Corsairs to the test. They're flying cover in a mission to bomb a Japanese airbase. Suddenly, dozens of Japanese Zeros pounce. The Black Sheep and their Corsairs trade blows with Zeros in a chaotic melee. So by Boynton's account, he uh, had five kills, so uh, that made him a Marine ace. Uh, that, that gave him the ace in the day status. By the time this fight was over and Boynton returned to base, he had uh, very little gas, only 10 gallons left, which is not much for the engine the size of a Corsair, and very little ammunition, 30 rounds of ammunition left. So it was a long, hard fight, and he took it right to the last minute. By him doing that, he established himself as the leader of his squadron who could go out and shoot down airplanes with this Corsair airplane, which is a tremendous confidence builder and a big boost to all the young 20-year-old pilots in his squadron. 